Hour Hour with the pros. And uh, in case you're joining us uh, in the middle of the conversation here, this is, we're proud to have Colin Thompson with us. Colin is, uh, is going to be able to talk to us from a few different perspectives tonight. And we're really, uh, really excited about that. Colin, of course, is a former Temple tight end, and he's currently playing in the NFL with the Carolina Panthers. And uh, the Panthers are four and five uh, heading into their game this week. Uh, I'm really excited to have Colin with us. Colin and I have known each other for about seven years now. So in addition to my role here at Temple and being the managing director of, the, of student media, uh, advising the Temple News, Temple RWHIP, uh, teaching a couple of classes as an adjunct, and now I'm the, the very excited to be the co-director of the Claire Smith Center for Sports Media, of which Colin is a member of our steering committee. So we're very, very excited about that. Um, I know Colin because uh, in staying involved with sports writing, I'm the editor of a website called alscoop.com. It's in the Yahoo Sports Network. We cover Temple football and basketball and recruiting. And I, I first reached out to Colin for a recruiting story because a, I guess a transfer story. Colin was one of the most highest, highest recruited and highest rated tight ends in his class, played at Archbishop Wood, went to the University of Florida before he incurred an injury there, transferred to Temple. And um, I think a lot of this will come through tonight when you hear this. So I got a phone number for Colin, called him for a story. Colin, I think I might have called you at your home number because um, I think you're, I think somebody else answered. And you got on the phone and after I was done interviewing Colin, I texted Matt rule. And I said, he sounds like he's like 20 going on, on 35, uh, was just a pleasure to talk to. And I said, I, at first I, for a couple of seconds, I thought I wouldn't have been talking to your dad. He was just really easy to talk to. It was a great interview. And, um, you know, it was just always somebody I really enjoyed interviewing and covering and we've stayed in touch. And, uh, Colin's done a lot of different things in addition to playing in the NFL, in the one season before he got back into the NFL, he was working as a sideline reporter at Temple Games for 97.5, The Fanatic. He's been on a couple of different radio stations. Uh, of course, he's he started his Not For Long Media Company. He has a Not For Long Media uh, podcast. I'll, I'll drop the link uh, into the chat in a second about that. Uh, he's collaborated with us a lot on our Al Scoop podcast, The Scoop. Uh, we did a, a pregame YouTube show together when he was doing uh, the sideline reporting. That was, what, three seasons ago now, right? Yeah, it's crazy. I did Tyler reporting for three years at Temple. Yes. And while yeah. I was in and out of the league and, and our final year, we did a pregame show together, which was yeah. so much fun. Yeah. Fun pregame show and lot K some halftime stuff too. So, um, and Colin is, is really going to be able to provide us with a great perspective here because, uh, and I'll, I'll start off with this, you know, he's playing in the NFL. Um, you know, he's at the highest level of football that he can get to playing in the NFL. Uh, Last season, his first career catch goes for a touchdown. Can't do it much better than that. So, um, Colin, my first question for you, and, and what I'm going to do here just to let everybody know is I'll facilitate here and ask Colin the first couple of questions, and then we'll kind of get out of the way and, and make plenty of time for all of your questions. So if you want to raise a virtual hand, certainly we'll encourage you to do that. If you do feel more comfortable, you know, um, just dropping your question into the chat. Uh, we can uh, we can keep an eye out for it there. But if I know Colin, he's going to want to uh, see a name and a face and, and engage with you because he's great about doing that. So, Colin, my first question to you is, um, of course, you know, you get to the highest level of football that you can get to. What got you interested in 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 being in media when you could be doing other things with your time, you know, taking care of your body and you have a, a rigorous schedule as an NFL tight end? What got you into you know starting your own media company? John, thanks, and uh, appreciate everybody having me and the, and the wonderful, thoughtful in intro. It's it's been quite the journey, guys. I'll be honest with you, and I, I'm really just, uh, you know, one of you all, and just working a job that just happens to be more public. And I'm grinding like you guys are at my job, and then also working a little side hustle and trying to find ways to do it. John, there's a hundred ways to answer that question. What got me into media? You know, it hit me like a lightning bolt one day, and what really got me into it was, um. My dad would drive me to school when I went to Archbishop Wood because I was like the first bus or the last bus home. So it was like a five o'clock bus in the morning or I'd get home at like 4.30 mm -hmm. when we'd be done at like 2.15. So he's like, all right, I'll pick you up or I'll drop you off and then you can find a ride home or whatever it was. So every morning we listen to Mike and Mike in the morning on ESPN. And, you know, you never know where you're going to draw inspiration from. And, and really that truly inspired me to where I am today. And I listened to... 
my dad would talk about this is a former player, Mike Golix. Look, he's so articulate. He's got great ideas. He's fun. He's himself. He's got his hand in a few different things. You know, his kids were all athletes at, in professional level or college level. I don't know. That all just intrigued me. That whole, that whole life of, wow, I could play football and then I could be involved in some radio broadcasting, TV, media, color commentary of games. And that's where it all started. And then it kind of went to bed for a while when I went to the university of Florida and I, I'm going to get into my story here in a minute, guys, because I think that kind of paints the whole picture of how I've attacked this whole thing. First off, answering John's question, really, truly, why did I get into it? I think that's how I got into it. And then really over the years of just following, following just my passion and just, of course, playing and allows me to, this allows, uh, media allows, football allows media to coexist in what I do, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And taking advantage of that with the right people, like we have at Temple is an unbelievable thing. I'll fast forward. I am getting cut by the Giants. Uh, I got cut by the Giants because I had emergency appendectomy surgery mm -hmm. right after our Temple. This is 2017. And I come back to Temple and Jeff Collins just took over the program. And uh, this guy, who's a buddy of mine, John DeCarlo, reached out and says, hey, listen, man, I know you're back training at Temple and you're trying to get back into the NFL. Would you love to come on out? We'd love to have you on Al Scoop. So I go on Al Scoop and we get in this office and we huddle around a mic and I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool. This brings back the old memories of Mike and Mike in the morning and ESPN and all these things that draw them back to my youth. So um, I said, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to jump on your pod and kind of the rest is history. And that's how I started my podcast was really through John DiCarlo. And I started my podcast and not for long media when I got cut from the NFL from the first time and found out the NFL really stands for not for long. So um, I answered John's question and now like a true media person and a podcaster, I'm going to go completely off the rails now and kind of tell my story guys, because I think my story pertains to a lot of people in this room. If, and, and if it doesn't, I'm here to, to answer questions as well. So uh, I'm from the Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and I went to Archbishop Wood and I was a top recruit, like John said, and I had, had a lot of great opportunities to go to a lot of different things. I'm going to tie this all back into media. So in that process of being a, a top recruit, I would say from, man, I committed to Florida Cinco de Mayo of 2011. And let's say from January, 2010, almost every night or every other night, I was talking to a radio, uh, radio TV show, radio show. I was talking to 24 seven sports, ESPN, rivals, scout.com, and just saying yes to every single opportunity that came up. And anybody who asked me to do an interview about, you know, what it's like being a, this highly rated tight end or what it's like getting the scholarship or the Boston College, whatever paper reaches out to me and says, hey, listen, your first scholarship was Boston College. You know, what are your thoughts on that? So, again, talk about like developing my side career while I'm doing my regular career. So the whole point of me bringing that up was I just said yes to every single opportunity that was there. Um, I heard someone, you know, actually a buddy of mine came on my podcast the other day and he's like, when you get older, or when you get successful, you learn how to say no to people. And I like disagree with them. I just. I don't know. There's a way to say yes to everybody and yes to opportunity. It's just how you kind of curtail it and make it work. So that's how I really started to get into the media side was look back to high school. I was getting these reps of talking to reporters and, and learning how to build these relationships with people I do not know. And they're just calling my house phone and, you know, my dad's in the other room saying, Hey, you need to articulate more. Hey, you need to tell your story more. Hey, you need to, you know, listen to Mike and Mike in the morning and, and articulate a story like they do. So that's where it really started for me when you talk about the youth level of I was a sophomore, junior in high school, and I was really lucky to have parents that supported me in that and said, hey, listen, take these phone calls and interview with all these people. And everyone says this is a distraction, but it's really not a distraction. If you handle it the right way, it's going to actually elevate you. And still to this day, NFL players, tons of athletes have podcasts and people still view this as a distraction. People still view what I'm doing here as a distraction, but I completely and adamantly disagree because it's all part of the learning lessons and the growth of life. You guys will all be involved in different things, right? You're going to have, like I said earlier, a side hustle. You're going to have a side profession. You're going to have things you have a passion for and aren't going to make you any money, but people are going to view them as distractions of your job, but really it's all encompassing in the, your growth as a media member. So I had high school, I had all these experiences with that, which was tremendous. And I look back and saying, wow, I had all those reps in such a raw age of my life. And then you get to Florida and you're on the map, big time on the map. Um, 
we were bigger at Florida than we are here with the Carolina Panthers when it comes to players. I went everywhere in Gainesville and every single person knew my name. It was very unique. And I only played three games at Florida and I broke my right foot twice and broke my left foot twice and had two toe injuries and had a knee injury and both shoulders. So I had tons of injuries and I got medically released in my scholarship. And I went from a point of time where I was doing interviews all the time and involved and was a part of the team to literally silence and no one really wanted me at all. I went from 30 scholarships and top rated tight end in the country to nothing. And again, I'm telling my football story along with the media story because I really think they go hand in hand. I also would practice young age tweeting. And right when Twitter came out, it was like announcing scholarships. It was such a big thing. You see kids do it all the time now, right? They post pictures of the schools. Sounds crazy and not too long ago, but I was doing that like 11 years ago. Hmm. Sounds super old, but literally 11 years ago we were doing, I was doing that and like thinking through it and talking to my teammates about it and talking to my professors and teachers at at Archbishop Wood about, Hey, am I doing this the right way? And what do you think? And just again, media creation, which is at the end of the day, why we're here, some sort of creating. So I went to Florida then to Temple was my only scholarship, really the only place that really wanted me after having every offer I could have ever dreamed of and more, more than I needed. You only need one. I had more than I needed to some great places to be a student athlete. So I get to Temple and just like anything from my experience of doing these interviews in high school and they tapered off when I was at Florida, people like John DeCarlo started calling, Hey, what's it like being a Temple out? Are you excited to be back home? All those great media questions about coming back to the city of brotherly love and playing in a great city and a great market and going to a school Temple that I really knew nothing about. I'm from the area, but I never really was a Temple other than a camp in 2006 to play, to go to football camp. So Um, you know, I'll start to digress here and get to the next question, but I think it's important to know that I just, the reps are what made, have what allowed me to get to where I am to speak to you guys today. And someone thinks this is an influence enough for me to speak to you guys today. It's the rep. So, um, fast forward through my career at Temple and had all the experience with the media there and the, the Philadelphia media. And I started tapping into some of the wonderful things that Temple has and I know it sounds cliche and it sounds like I'm a recruiter, but we're all here. We all go to the school. We all love the school, but it's really, really, truly, it's, it's a special place. And through the connections of football, I started getting connected with people 97.5 the Fanatic, 94.1 WIP. Um, again, my study at Temple was not all journalism and media. It was just a, a really kind of a, a blanket approach to media. And I'm just trying to figure it out and leave it wide open and see where it goes. Um, and that allowed me to meet wonderful people like Dr. Gratson and, some unbelievable people like Justin Miller, who just works with all the athletes. And, and again, I'm in football, so I get to meet someone like John DiCarlo. So I'm, I, I could have taken John's class, but I got to talk to John on a daily basis and we got to talk through all those things. So saying yes to things is really the common thread through all this. So again, I get cut from the Giants. Talk about media training. I was extremely confident going into New York because I knew I was in Philadelphia. I went to Gainesville. I'm going into the epicenter of media in New York City, especially as a New York Giants. The Jets are awesome. And they have a great base, but the New York Giants are are everything, and they're they're massive in New York City. Um, so that was really intriguing itself. And the team was pushing me in front of the mic and getting me more involved in those interviews. When I was an undrafted tight end, we had a first round pick tight end in Evan Ingram, who's still there and is still a great player. But they were pushing me in front of the mic because of my connections and the people I've talked to over the years. And you want to talk about a connection is really Coach Rule. Coach Rule, coach for the Giants, and Temple Tough rang through the hallways there when I would walk down the hallway, and I'd be walking next to $10 million Evan Ingram, and here's $4,500 Colin Thompson, and he, and we were walking together, and Temple Tough would ring down the hallways because the people of the Giants were supportive of Coach Rule, and a lot of the Giants people were all from Temple. I'm going all over the place. That's what I do. I get to know a lot of you on here, and that's what I do, but I think it all matters and is compass into the situation of how you carry yourself, how you say yes to everything and how it leads to just opportunities like that. Yes, my talent in football got me there, but I think really the stuff off the field matters just as much as the stuff on the field. So Giants, I got cut from the Giants and this is really, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, and on to the next question, I go to back to Temple. Again, broken hearted. Very similar to my situation in Florida, an injury ruined my career. And this is an injury that I had no control over. I look back on my foot injuries, I think I could have had some more control over them. I look back on emergency appendectomy, I have no idea how I can have controlled that situation. Maybe a little sh- less stress and anxiety, but that comes with any profession that we really care about. So I get cut and it's time to go home. 
it's time to go home. And that was really tough to go back to Temple. But luckily, people like Jeff Collins and the staff said, you can come back and train in Temple. It saved my career. I would not be in the NFL without it. So I got to be back around the university that took me in. That took me in after I kind of got kicked to the curb there a little bit when it comes to football. And I got really close with John. And I got close with Pat Kraft, the athletic director, because he was around the program, a new program. And I got close with just people in the media industry that I really didn't have the chance to at school because I was playing football and all these different things. So as you all know, it's open door policy, especially with Dr. Gratson and a lot of the professors at Temple. You get to go back forever. This isn't just, hey, pay, pay the bill and we'll see you, that, see you never. Scott Gratson, he still owes me a coffee. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I owe you a coffee. But uh, <laughs> so my, my point with all of it is I started this podcast because of John. I had zero experience doing color commentary. None. And I went to Pat Kraft because Harry Mays, who's a friend of mine who I connected with because he was a 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5 The Fanatic did our pregame shows. And Matt Rule would go on 97.5 The Fanatic once a week. And after one of our games, Harry Mays was interviewing players. And I took the time instead of running in the locker room and singing the Alice White song, I took the time to introduce myself to Harry Mays. And Harry Mays texts me out of nowhere and says, Colin, I broke my ankle. There's no sideline reporter. Are you interested in stepping in my job as doing a sideline reporter? Harry's playing golf. He slipped on some acorns and broke his ankle. I can't tell you how that happened, but he did it. So I jumped in. I said, Pat Kraft, uh, no experience, but I love Temple. I have know a ton about the team, and I would love to do it. So I shadowed the great Kevin Cop for one game. And I shadowed Kevin, and I told Kevin like four or five different things that I thought he could have pointed out or should point out. And he's like, this is awesome, man. You're going to do great at this. And then kind of the rest is history with that, and I got embedded in that side of the media. A world where I have never had experience with before, but just saying yes and having that kind of another thing I want to talk about today is there's going to be a point in time where maybe you think you're unprepared for something, but you're prepared for it because you've been saying yes to all these things over the years. I had zero experience doing radio, but I've been listening to radio for a long time. I've been watching TV and sports for a long time and with some intent, not just passing time with it. So, and that's for you guys too, or in anybody who wants to be a young journalist is really like, you're just always dialed in a little bit, even when you're out having a good time or when you're at home with family or you're home at Thanksgiving watching the game. 25% of you can be on really what your, what your job is and you can still have a good time. So my point is I, I, I kind of jumped into this media world head first. I didn't have a ton of experience with it, but I don't know the roadmap to it other than just saying yes to all these things. And I got to call Temple Games for three years and got to connect with Hall of Famers like Paul Palmer and Harry Donahue and Got to do pregame shows with John DiCarlo when I was like, John, I'm coming to Temple. I'm doing these games for four hours. I'm there two hours before the game preparing. Let's do something. So here John and I are trying roast beef sandwiches at Rob Silk's tailgate, and we're grading them like we're, you know, we're doing pizza grading. And it was just crazy, like, atmosphere. And we probably were getting 10 views of video, but we were just creating content and just moving the ball forward and getting involved and making contact uh, contacts with guys like Kyle Gauss and Sam Newman and, you know, all of a sudden here's Sam Newman and his family are coming to Carolina Panther games last year. And just the, just the connectability in this profession is unbelievable. Um, I'm rambling on more, but I'm looking at my notes here and I know it's time for another question, John, but that's kind of my story about getting to kick off into it. And yeah, I bounced around from the giants. I went to the bears and was in the Chicago media market. Then I got cut from there and was out of football for a while. And I was in marketing for my mom's retail company, LSL brands in Bucks County. I worked in finance and started a podcast for them. Um, really I've done a lot of different things and wore different, a lot of different hats because I've said yes to so many things and just tried it. And then I was in the AAF that shut down because of financial reasons. I was in Birmingham, Alabama. I was in the XFL in Tampa and that shut down because of COVID-19, our old friend. And then um, I've been with the Carolina Panthers for two years. So it's been quite the journey. That's kind of my story and kind of the involvement of how media plays a role in it. And that's really to answer John's question in a 21 minute way. <laughs> um, that's, uh, you know, that's how I got into it all. Thanks, Colin. Speaking of speaking of Dr. Gratz and Scott, I know you said you had to run to uh, run, run to a pride event later. So I want to get to get to you first, because I think you said you're on a, a tight schedule. I know you have your hand up. So I want to have you uh, get the opportunity to ask uh, Colin a question here. Thanks, John. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I've got to run to a pride meeting. By the way, if you're around New York this uh, summer, Colin, come march with us. Happy to send you some info if you'd like. I love it. Anyone Please else? do. I'd, I'd, I'd be, I'll, I'll send you some info and related to info, there are several students uh, 
from 1111 from Calm that are in the program now. And I'm wondering uh, before, uh, before you go, if, if, if you could tell them looking back now that you've been done with college for a while and, and now that you've had all these experiences, if you could look back on yourself when you were in the middle of it, in the middle of Temple, or even when you arrived at Temple, because there's a lot of first years here, what advice would you? Scott, you, you accidentally you accidentally muted yourself, Scott. He's full of passion. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so if I if I had I, I just wanted to tell you before I head out because I want to go to Pride in this this meeting thing. You know how it goes. I adore seeing you. I admire you beyond words, and you look great. Though I still think you need to wear a kilt because I think you look amazing in it. So, <laughs> right beard at the red right going in. Yeah, so, yeah. Did that it, you scream Highlands? I to ask my students. I've been telling them this. But if you were to say your, if you were to look back at yourself now being where they are, what would you say to yourself and thus to them? Don't worry. It's all gonna work out. And I think the endless pursuit of, and that's really cliche guys, I know I'm really just one of you guys. I'm a 27 year old kid, right? Like if I was in this meeting and some guy was like, yeah, don't worry, it's all gonna work out. I'm just being real with you guys. It's trying to be so real and transparent as possible. That's just kind of what I wanna do because that's what really matters. Um, it's just, don't worry, it's gonna work out. And the other bit of advice I would say on the other side is right, saying yes and getting involved as much as possible is don't wait around to make your own success. I wish I would have done more. And now I operate on a full slate and I'm always adding, but don't wait around. You could always start something, right? I have a podcast, a podcast, everybody has one, right? We'll just start one and figure it out. I edit our podcast. I, I've done all the social media. I have a team of five people now, but I've done literally every aspect of the podcast world and I'm learning more every day. Excuse me. So don't worry, it's going to be okay. And I would say that the most important thing for you guys is to get going on things. Don't wait for, well, I'm a freshman. You know, I'm going to wait for the curriculum to happen in class for me to start a podcast. Or I'm going to wait for um, my senior year to reach out to John to Carl. I use John because John's on the screen and John's been an, an unbelievable friend and asset in this business to me to pick the brain and learn from. Um, so get it going. Get the ball moving on things, whether you're doing one episode a month and I'm just using podcasts, guys, you could be anything it is, whether I'm doing one thing a month, hey, you're getting the ball moving. Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm on Christmas break. I'm going to start this. Just don't stop and you'll, you'll really just grow up. You'll just grow your uh, work tolerance to just a great level where you'll be able to balance things and you'll be at a point where like just a 30 minute break is all you need instead of like, I need a break today and I need a nap and all these things on the off day, which is where I'm going with my mind, right? It's like week 10. You know, I don't need to have the podcast meeting tonight. I should probably cancel it. We got a best of episode coming out this week. So, you know, the work's kind of already haze in the barn there. It's like, no, I need to get going. I need to do this. I need to do some prep for this meeting. I need So I'm all over the place per usual, guys. But for me, it's don't worry. It's all going to work out. But on the flip side, if you get the ball moving on things, then you'll never have to get ready because you'll always be staying ready. Thanks, Colin. So we'll start getting uh, – we have uh... – a lot of questions in the queue here. So I'm just going to go down the list and thank, thank you all for taking the time to ask some questions. Really appreciate it. Daniel, we'll start with you. What's your question for Colin? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to say thank you so much, Colin, for coming on and sharing your experiences. It's, it's very great to listen to. I appreciate it very much. Um, no but my, I have a lot of questions for you, but I'll, I'll stick to one. Um, my biggest question for you is as somebody who has experienced both sides of the relationship between uh, athletes and the media, what knowledge have you gained? And more specifically, like um, what advice do you have for somebody on um, the media side um, and like bolstering these relationships with athletes? That's a great question, Daniel. And I'm, I'm sure several of you have that question. I know John and I have talked through that and, uh, with Sarah as well. It's a fantastic uh, question. I think to me, connectability. It's a word not used well enough. W what do you have and how do you connect, right? That's the million dollar question. How do you connect? Great. It's great to say that word and it's a fancy word and it's kind of used today with different businesses and whatever. But to me, it's like displaying who you are and putting that out there, not being emotional with how you're going to do things. I'm again, I'm probably going to refer a lot to Twitter here, guys. It's a space I live on, but 
I see a lot of media members act in emotion and I unfollow them as a player immediately. And some of these people are my friends in this market included down here in Charlotte, but they act in emotion instead of acting in fact, acting in a quote, reacting to a quote from someone, reacting to a stat, reacting to their own eyes. Maybe I'm a media member and I want to get into football more. I want to download maybe NFL game pass and watch the tape and talk through things. Um, you know, maybe I want to tweet at a player and ask him a legitimately professional question. Um, but it's the connectability. How do you connect, Daniel? I think, and for everyone in here, it's having a, a strong social media base because our world is all this right now. Yes, we're going to be able to connect in person, but how many times are you going to get a mic in front of somebody's face and do that stuff? That's not long gone, but this is so much more convenient, right? I, like we could do this once a week, guys, right on here. I could do this. We could go six to seven once a week, every Tuesday night. And it's all about the connectability. So if I go to your Twitter page and it's just kind of full of just random thoughts and there's no theme to it and there's no fun to it and there's no kind of a pattern to the things you're passionate about, then I don't know if I'd follow you back. And if you've reached out to me or you shot me a direct message, hey, big fan of what you're doing on and off the field, um, love your podcast, uh, would love to pick your brain on it, whatever that may be, um, you know, shoot your shot in that sense where you're reaching out to guys and you're and you're you're connecting what's your connectability but i also think like i said it's about you it's about you it's about who you are as a person are you displaying that or are you just kind of being you know a college freshman on those social media pages or a college senior thank Thanks, you Colin. uh we'll go to we'll go to carter next carter what's your question for colin uh hi colin so um I was going to say I had a pretty similar experience with media with my dad. I just wanted to mention that, that like talk show radio, like got me into media and sports media. Love it. Um, but what I was going to say is how do you think your college experience would have been different now with the new, um, how you can use your name, image, and likeness and you can make money off of it. And I know how you talked about being a high, high recruit and, this and that. I, and I don't know what you could have done with media to make money for it, but I don't know if you just, if you've ever thought of that since that came out, because I think it's pretty interesting now the money kids can make and just the different opportunities now that are out there. Not to plug my podcast, but we've had two awesome guests on Thilo Kunkel, who's a professor of Temple. Uh, Thilo came on and we did, we could have went very long. We did about an hour on name image likeness. And then we had Darren Heitner, who's one of the biggest NIL of lawyers in the country he's down at fort lauderdale and he, there's some awesome information all that stuff and i think for you guys the more you can understand and more you can read the more you can dive in we talked about connectability daniel that's all about connectability being able to have those conversations um it's a fantastic question what would i do differently i'm kind of in that mode right now so i'm selling myself name image and likeness in the nfl but I'm doing it with my podcast. I'm having sponsors. And then again, learning all the things that come along with that, how to, how to have a contract, how to negotiate things, um, how to make sure I'm buttoned up, you know, with the law, how to handle things when I'm paying bills and taxes. And I'm kind of going all over the place, but these are all the things that happen in NIL that I hope, I hope universities are doing because these kids could be falling in some money here and no one's giving them any really advice on how to handle it or who's reading their, their, uh, their contracts. I'm going off the wall, but it's a great, it's a great question, Carter. How would I handle it? I don't know. I know I would have probably attacked it and said yes to a lot of things and just gave it a shot and just kind of took the leap of faith on faith on some things. But I'm doing it right now, I'll be honest with you, with with um with the podcast. And I don't think if I had the podcast, I don't think anybody would cut me a check. I don't I don't think so. I don't think people would cut me a check for me just sending a tweet. I don't have that clout. That's not where I stand in the NFL right now. That's not where I would have stood, probably a temple. It probably would have been local products, businesses that I already have relationships with, businesses that I've probably already worked for, businesses that, you know, I've gotten to know. Two sponsors of my podcast are family friends. One is family, one is friend. The rest of them I've kind of gotten to know over time. So it goes back to the connectability. It goes back to building your brand. It goes back to uh, that brand of, okay, what am I? Am I just, as a media member, am I, do I have a podcast? Am I sharing my thoughts publicly? Am I getting those reps in? Because when that time comes, are you going to be able to really answer those questions? Like NIL, uh, it's a great question. I beat around the bush a little bit with it, but there's so much to it. And there's so much to unpack. It's, it's an unbelievable thing. I think if you checked out those episodes, you learn a lot because I learned a ton. 
Thanks, Colin. Uh, we'll go to Will next. Will, oh, what's your question for Colin? Hi, Colin. Uh, again, thanks for coming in. It's really, it's cool to hear your perspective on all these things. Um, well, something that you said that I really resonated with, you said that you watched sports with intent growing up, which made a lot of sense to me. My question was, uh, what was your first color commentating experience really like? Because that's something I've always been interested in. When I watch the games, I watch it with intent, kind of listening to that. Um, something I definitely have a passion for. So did you like, were you nervous for your first commentating experience or how did that, how did that play out for you? I'm looking at the, I'm Googling right now. I forget the game. Trust me, it means a lot to me. I'm not saying I, it doesn't, but I want to, I want to get it right. It was after Houston 2017 Temple. Let's see if John can guess it on top of his head. It was East Carolina. It was East Carolina on the road. Yes. East Carolina on the road. And, um, the cannon was firing off behind me at East Carolina. When they score or they kick off, there is a loud cannon. And thank God my mic was off because I, <laughs> I had some choice words. It scared the crap out of me, literally. I mean, it is, it's so loud. Uh, what was that experience like? It was awesome. It was awesome. It was so unique. Um, listening with 10 over the year, intent over the years paid off. It really did. Uh, my nerves were high, but when you work with professionals and they have trust in you, like a Harry Donahue, a Temple, Ring of Honor, Paul Palmer, College Football Hall of Famer, guys have been doing it for years, and, they, and you, you have the kind of trust in each other that allows you to, to have success. So it was fun. The mic wasn't working. I wasn't even able to share my opening thoughts of the game. We had to walk up and down. I had to take the elevator back up to the press box four different times to connect to the server. So uh, it's a great question. It, what was it like? It was probably a little bit of a nightmare. Now that I'm, it's bringing back some stories, but well, it was uh, it was some good times, man. It was great. I was able to travel with the team too, so that was a unique aspect of again. I'm like, well, let me just give this a try. I'm now I'm I'm out of football right now. I'm training, but let me travel with the team. Let me get experience, and I got to know a whole new group of coaches and I'll make all the all, all new relationships with people. And because uh, Coach Collins, the new staff, came in behind Coach Rules, so that was really unique in itself. And then you know these awesome media members and all these different people, so. Yeah, it's a great question. Will it brings back some bond memories for me, man. It, it was a uh, it was a unique day for sure, and and I was able to call about three seasons worth of games. Uh, it was a tremendous experience. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Colin. We'll go to Troy next. Troy, what's your question for Colin? Hi, Colin. Thank you for taking the time out to answer questions. No problem, man. Appreciate you coming on. My question is: You talk about like the injuries and basically overcoming them. And that requires a lot of mental toughness. And in a field like, like sports media, it's very, I wouldn't say cutthroat, but very competitive. So you have to be very mentally tough during it. So like, what have you learned that allows you to like stay mentally tough, stay prepared, like even if you don't get that big break right away? And how have you like developed as a commentator like throughout the course of your career? So I'll answer the first question, uh, the, second, the second question first. How do I develop it? I think, like I said before, it's the reps. Create reps for yourself. So if it's you on a mic and you have a podcast and, you know, it's, it's, you know, the Troy, Troy newbie show, and this is what I'm doing. And you have a guest like myself on or John or whomever, and you reach out and you start talking about those type of things and, and getting those reps. That's important. But to answer your first question, how do you build the mental toughness? How do you sustain through everything? I think really it's honestly in what, what you're doing, what you're producing, because if you know you're producing the, great work and you know you're working to be better every day then you really can't ask more of yourself so if you're listening to other pot again i'll speak in podcast terms i think that's easy for us to understand i listen to five or six different podcasts from a flyers daily podcast with an old friend jason Martitis to joe rogan who's the biggest podcast in the world to uh i've listened to the danica patrick show because i liked her intro and i kind of created that into ours i've listened to several different podcasts uh in so many different things. I listen to a, a Barstool Sports podcast and Spitting Chicklets because I think it's fun and interactive and I take in everything from everyone. Um, and then I get the reps. So I really do think though, and that's something I want to drive home with you guys, is it's all about, in my opinion, it's about the quality. Everything counts. Um, I edit my own podcast, even though we have four pretty, four very successful producers the final product comes to me and I put the final product together because I really think it matters. The tone, the lead in, everything. 
Um, I really, truly care about that stuff. So um, nothing goes unnoticed, um, whether you're uh, Claire Smith, who joined us at the bottom right corner, or you're Colin Thompson, who's trying to scrape together downloads on a podcast and, and grow a following and sell a bunch of different things. So it's sell, you know, sell marketing and sell those opportunities. So it's, it's a great question, but I think it's the quality of what you're doing. And that's going to make you allow you to be tough because you're going to be able to just withstand it all because you know, you're putting good stuff out the ability to learn and, and learn from others, learn from their mistakes as well. And then, like I said, like you asked the question of what can I do to improve? It's just get those reps and get it going, get the ball moving and listen to others. Great question. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Uh, is it Mateus or Matthias? How do I pronounce your first name? It's Mateus. But Mateus. Can be mad. yeah, it can be mad. It's easier. It's easier. Uh-huh. Thank you. Um, What's your question for Colin? Yeah, first, Colin, thanks for coming in. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, it seems like from hearing, like from his story and all, all that you told us, that you experience a lot of areas about media, like um, reporting, now the podcasting and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wondering, why did you choose a podcast specifically? Because I'm, I'm a fan. I, I, I'm always like, I'm taking communication studies because I don't know what area of media I'm going to. And I'm starting also podcasts. And I kind of can relate to what you're doing in some way, somehow, besides the football. But um, why do you choose it? Is, is it because of like the growth in the market of it? Just like you mentioned, there's a lot of podcasts you hear a lot. It's, or is it a passion? Is the freedom that you can like you can create whatever you want basically if you start your own? Why do you choose it? That's a great question. I'm trying to think back. They weren't as popular then. This was 2017. COVID really flooded the market, um, and now it's more competitive ever with them. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything. People see that as discouraging. I think it's the new form. I think you know radio is kind of I don't want to say dead, and I'm a radio fan, but we could choose what we listen to now in the car. We could just put on what we want with really no commercials and, and maybe commercial and brand that we align with because they align with the brand in itself uh, of the person. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic question, Matt. I, I think why I started was, yeah, you have your own voice and the curiosity of, I need to learn how to do this. I was like, all right, John, what mic am I buying? Okay. You got to buy this Yeti mic. And then we're going to start with audacity. And then that crashed on me like seven times. <laughs> and then I went to, you know, anchor and I went to garage band and I went to iMovie and, I just learned a ton. I learned a ton. You could not, you can't put a value, excuse me, on, on that learning process of YouTubing. How do I do this? And how do I do that? So um, it's a flooded market for sure. But again, those reps matter massive. And if it's something you want to do and you want to figure out, I've changed the podcast four or five different times now, completely different. I was going to be all sports and be all that. And then really with this one, I joke, it's, I took the Joe Rogan model of, of just kind of random. And that's who I am. It was really not random, but it's random with my passion. So we've had, you know, people on like Christian McCaffrey and Adam Schefter, who, yeah, of course, they're massive football brands. They're huge. And so thankful they come on, Chris Long. But we've had Nell Fortner, the women's basketball coach, Georgia Tech on. We've had, um, we've had chefs on. We've had designers on. We've had musicians on. We've had comics on. So that's kind of who I am. And, and I didn't start like that. So I think... Uh, yes, why I started it was the creativity side of it and the unknown, and then also the ability to transition and pivot three different times or four different times now. That I'm on episode like 45 on this current one, but I've probably done 300 episodes in my life all through Nonprofit Law. Thank you. No, great question. Uh, Zach, we'll go to you next. Um, hey, Colin, thanks for taking the time out. Uh, oh, I have one quick question first. You said you went to Archbishop Wood, right? I did. Um, you guys if I remember correctly, you used to have a summer camp where you'd have like younger, uh, like 12 to 13 year olds come in. Yeah. And I'm 99% sure when I went, you were one of the guys that were there, or at least I went maybe when you were in high school, but I, I went to that camp. That would probably be 2000 and, uh, 2011. Yeah. Right around then. Yep. Awesome, man. Hey, connect man. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's what it's all about. And then my uh, my other question was, if I can find it in my notes right here, um, what was the one thing you learned about yourself in between your freshman year of college and now? Oh man, 
one thing. <laughs> like the one main thing you feel like that has been like the most important for you. No, that's a great question. I've learned a lot. I'm a completely different person. Man, what's the one thing or what is one thing that I've learned between freshman year and college to now that I have no idea what I was uh, doing. Uh, but I look back and I smile, I smile because I, I attack, I try to attack everything that I was doing. I tried to have the values of everything matters. I mean, I think that's huge um, for young people in the business is that everything matters. Content matters. Um, that's a great question. Is Sarah puts that below? I mean, you got me absolutely stumped. What's the one thing? I don't even know which way to go. I'm also trying not to ramble on here like I have and just be concise with the answer. But now it's a great question. I just think the one thing I learned again is, is the quality. The quantity is, is not all, it's not all about the quantity. And also nothing, nothing goes unnoticed. Nothing. Who you follow, what you like. Again, I'm talking social media. I'm talking podcasting. I'm talking to things that are really popular in our theme of communications now, media. Uh, everything goes noticed. So, yeah, it's a great question. You got me stumped on it. I'll probably have to come back to it. Okay, we'll go to AJ next. AJ I know, has, to, has to run to something else. I wanted to have him uh, get the opportunity to fit his question in here. AJ, what's your question for Colin? Hey, Colin. Thanks for fitting me in. Uh, I really appreciate you being out here. Uh, now, my question is related to being on both sides of the football here. There's a, obviously a big disconnect between when it comes to reporters who used to be former players and then reporters who were trying to make it out of college. Uh, and there's a big gap between those two, uh, partly that comes from the football knowledge aspects. Uh, if you were to give a piece of advice to, say, a student reporter who has good knowledge of the game but has never played the sport to really uh, kind of narrow that gap, what would you have to say? Uh, it's a great question. We've talked about this a few different times, the best way to narrow the gap, how to do it. I think start with your own personal brand, your own personal connectability, building that brand, having good content, being emotionless with how you're responding to things, basing it off of quotes, basing it off of facts, basing it off of, um, of a stat instead of like, here's what I think, this is a mess. There's, there, there's, there's some media members, again, in our market here that, that are just – and we get it easy. We're in Carolina. We were in Philly. We've lost like five out of our last four, uh, four out of our last five games. We've been getting shredded in Philadelphia. So we can hide out a little bit down here. But again, it's, it's, it's about you. It's about your personal brand. It's about your knowledge. It's about you going to coaches seminars uh, for, that are public to all people or going to, you know, seminars about learning the game differently or listening to different coaches, press conferences or, listening to coaches conferences from years back, you could see everything that coach rule has done. He's an unbelievable speaker. You want to know more about the game? Listen to coach rule, listen to the great coaches in the business. Now with YouTube, you can learn so much stuff. So really bury yourself into that AJ of kind of that YouTube rabbit hole. If I could give an exact thing of, okay, how I need to learn more about the business. Yes, of course. And learn more about the game, excuse me, and build that gap is you had to educate yourself, but I'd also do this. I would also say this and tread lightly. And I think John does an unbelievable job with it. He says it too much to me. I know I'm a media member. I know I'm a media member, but I think I have a good opinion about this, or I have some educated guesses about this. What are your thoughts? Do you agree with this? Explain this to me from a football's perspective. It's that put down your sword. I know where I stand as a media member that didn't play the game. I have curiosity. I have passion for it. Can you explain it to me? And then take that, put that in your bank and say, hey, listen, Colin Thompson told me this. He played tight end. This defensive end plays this way. He's a problem for Colin. Hey, um, uh, uh, Lane Johnson, Jason Peters, um, you're playing that DN this weekend. How does that affect you? And then all of a sudden watch your credit go up. So, again, it's I'm a little all over the place there, but it's build that brand in yourself. Educate yourself with the resources we have in this world, like a YouTube. Um, from really true football people, not just someone just going rogue and saying this guy missed a block, but really it's really not his block to make. And then ask players questions with your sword away. I need some help here. You know, guns down here. Explain this to me. Explain what happened on this play, good or bad. And then take that information and go from there. Hope I answer your question. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, AJ. I appreciate you coming on, bro. Thank you.
Thanks, Colin. Uh, Ryan, we'll go to you next. Hi, Colin. How are you? What's up, Ryan? Um, so you talked a lot about getting reps and things that you're passionate about. And um, obviously being involved in the NFL, being a player and uh, growing your own podcast. Those are two things that require a ton of energy. Uh, and I was wondering if you have sacrificed anything uh, at the expense of growing both of these things or if you haven't, how have you balanced it? It's a great question again. Um, have I sacrificed everything? Every, anything? Yes, I think you're going to sacrifice anything that you care about, but I don't think you do it as sacrifice. Um, you really don't. Yes, okay, I missed maybe some social events. Um, but at the end of the day, like, this is what I really want to do. So you don't really see it as a sacrifice. Yes, in hindsight, I may miss a party. Again, I'm talking to a college in a college sense here. I may miss a party. I may miss a show downtown, or I may not be able to go to the Flyers game on a Thursday night because I want to start my own podcast or I want to go in a deep dive. Like we just talked about on YouTube and learn more about football because I'm going to start getting into this profession and asking questions of football players. So yeah, you, you sacrifice a lot to be successful in anything or I'm nowhere near successful as a media member. I'm trying to be, I'm grinding at it, but that consistency, that good product, I think is key. So that's a great question. It really is. You're going to sacrifice a lot. But like I said, I don't think you view it as sacrifice if you have true passion for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. John, we'll go to you next. Hi, Colin. Um, I really want to thank you for coming in. Um, this has been very interesting so far. And I really liked how you tied football and media together. Um, I saw you were on the 2015 um, Temple roster. And what comes to mind when I think of 2015 is the Halloween game against Notre Dame. I was at that game, it was insane. Um, so there was a lot of media attention on Temple and it was arguably probably the biggest game in Temple football history. You guys can disagree with me on that or not. Um, so how did that, like all that attention with game day being there and you know, like finally, like everybody's looking at Temple football, how did that attention benefit you in your uh, media career uh, leading up to now? Well, that's a great question. Uh, well, let's go to John, the Temple football expert here. Is that the biggest game in Temple football history? I'd say so. I, I would think so. As I mean, obviously, I didn't, I didn't play like Colin did, but you have to consider this program was almost dropped in 2004 and passed and stayed relevant by one vote from the Board of Trustees. And then when you, know, when you saw what Al Golden did and then you get to the point where Matt Rule had things, and uh, that was a whole day long event. And I, I, I think your question is a great one because I remember asking Tyler Matikevich about it. I probably asked Colin about it at some point. How do you guys block it out? Colin was probably a little bit more used to it playing at Florida. But yeah, I think it was because Notre Dame has that New York Yankees fan base, that Duke fan base. I used to, I, just for fun, I'll ask people like, what was your favorite class at Notre Dame? And they're usually like, shut up, but I didn't go there. So there were a lot of Temple fans at that game, a ton. It was. To see that atmosphere with game day, oh, so many people were looking around saying, I, I didn't think this would have been possible. And then for, for, for Colin and the team to go out and play the way they did, you know, hopefully Colin doesn't get mad at me for saying this. They should have won that game. Oh, we should have. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, safety takes the right angle on the, on that pass, you know, there's an interception there. He's also down. see John with the football knowledge. He sees the safety who misses the pass, but also the cornerback in cover two who's supposed to jam the wide out and not allow the safe the receiver to have a clean release. And there goes Will Fuller running north towards Roman Catholic, where he went to school right down Broad Street. Um, so right, that's another aspect of the football side of it. Yeah. Hey, Colin, the safety's involved right from a media perspective. What else did you see? Which I know John knows that. I'm just giving him crap. But no, I could not have explained that as well as Colin. But yes, I think yeah. it was in terms of atmosphere, the whole thing. I think the biggest, biggest moment, biggest game in the program's history. So we'll go back over to, to Colin for this. Thing. Yeah, it's a great question. How did it boost your question, John, was how did it boost my what following or my. Yeah, like how did that it, um, experience really like looking back on that? How do you like what? can you take from that experience that benefits you now? Well, let me ask you that question because you were at the game. Yes. Can you answer your own question? Did it change you? Um, well, first of all, I was at the game as a Notre Dame fan. Was um, I, was, I, grew I, was die, I was die hard back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, still I grew up a Notre Dame fan, John, just to be clear. I wanted to go to the school. 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah hey, I mean, I give them, I give them their due credit. It yeah. Does. So, but did it affect you, John, seeing that atmosphere, knowing uh, the coverage, knowing it was college game day, where you're like, I want to go to a school like Temple because of this opportunity. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it changed me in how I looked at Temple, and it changed me. I'm a, I'm a transfer student, um, and when it came evident that I wanted to transfer from my previous institution, I really considered Temple, and I always look back at that game and that that entire time period, and that really kind of changed my like my outlook on Temple University. And obviously I fell in love with the school and I'm here now mm. and I have nothing but great things to say. So I think if, for me, it really kind of goes back to that game and that experience. That's interesting. Now I want to hear what your thoughts are. Obviously you asked the question. So you, had, you know, you had some thoughts on it as well. I think, how did it affect me? I, I honestly, it was, it was a devastating loss. Um, and really it led to some, poor events for us later in the year we lost some games we shouldn't have lost everything is such a turn the page of event for us in football we beat Penn State first time in 72 years 75 years I think it is and literally the speech the next day from coach rule was that this is the highlights of our season we had a horrible year so the place is going crazy your phone's blowing up um, social media is blowing up and all of a sudden your your leader saying like you got to move on and I've learned that from coach rule and I just constantly am moving on from, from things good or bad or indifferent. Um, so it's a great question, John, looking back, it didn't have a crazy effect on me. No, because I was trying to get my body right. I was trying to do well in school. I was trying to see my family. I was trying to enjoy that moment because it was such a special moment. I was trying to do so many different things. Um, you don't have a lot of time to think about it. It goes by so quickly because next week we were playing the like USF and we lost John. Um, so yeah, it was, it's a great question. Um, uh, John I Daly. think you guys lost. You guys no. It was the the next game was SMU. That was the sixty to forty game, and then no, eventually you guys lost USF. USF. Yeah, they ran all over. They ran around us and all over yeah. us. Yep. So that's a great question, John Daly, and uh, it didn't have a ton of effect on me in that aspect. No, because I had to move on. The game that was the most, and I remember the most, was our last game at Temple, my last game there in the regular season, at least, and that's um, winning a championship in, in Annapolis, Maryland. Just because honestly, it was my last game. Um, and I had time to just really digest it. The bowl game was just you know, whatever. I mean, even if we won, I would say that, to be honest with you, because that was our last time together. Coach Rule left right after that game, and most of the staff did too, as well as some players. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Joseph, we'll go to you next. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Uh, Colin, I appreciate you coming as well. Thank I just you. had a question more so about um, your college career. Uh, first, at Florida, one of the Power Five schools. I couldn't imagine how that atmosphere was, but just being there and then going through the unfortunate injury you went through and having to transfer to Temple, basically like what made, I'm, I'm just like, I'm big on mental health, especially when it comes to sports. So what was your, like, not trying to get too much into it, but you know, the mentality moving forward, you might've been at like one of your lowest points of your career at that point, maybe feel like it's over kind of. So what was your like mentality moving forward? How'd you get past that? It's a great question, Joseph. I, I was literally just talking about this with my wife earlier, who I met at the University of Florida, who we were dating for six months and we had to make a decision that I am leaving to go play, pursue my NFL dream. And, and I have to go to Temple University. I'm going back home and she's still at the University of Florida playing lacrosse. And that was a struggle in itself. So you have the balance of your personal life. And then you have the balance of your professional career and you have to make a decision that, you know, 18, 19 years old here. OK, I got to make a life, another life changing decision here that is a real thing um, and at Florida I wasn't given a choice I was ruled medically ineligible to perform so even if I wanted to like I was trying to find ways to stay at Florida I loved it there and I was trying to find ways I'm like maybe I'll just walk on to the basketball team and just play the scout team and just whatever I'll uh, maybe I'll just ride the bench in baseball or what I don't know I just trying to find anything to be involved in sport because I always wanted to and they're like listen the doctors are like you're done here you can't play a sport here period We'll pay for your school, but no more football. So that was devastating, absolutely devastating. And then to leave and then be like an 18, 19 year old in your guy's world. And then to come to a place that I really didn't want to come to just being honest with you. I didn't want to, I, I was like, this is the school I picked. It was either Florida or Boston college or uh, let's see, it was like Stanford or Alabama and Wisconsin. They were like the five schools I was really juggling in my mind. And 
less than two years later, I'm in, I'm here, a, a place regardless of where it has nothing to do with Temple. I'm in a place that I, I didn't want to go to. Um, so that was a really big struggle, Joe, to be honest with you. I definitely struggled. Um, I definitely struggled. And John, I'll take all the questions. I'll stay as long as every, every question is asked, by the way. Nice. Um, but I definitely struggled, Joe. Definitely. Um, how did I handle that? I just continue to fight, I guess. I don't have an answer because I wasn't in a good place for a long time. And it hit me, I would say, probably my second year at Temple. I'm like, this is a wonderful place. And this is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Truly. Football perspective, academically, socially, it was tremendous. But I had to make a really big boy, big girl decision at 18, 19 that I probably wasn't ready to make, even though I thought I was maturity wise. So it, how did I handle it? It's a great question. Just like anything, you got to find, you know, your happiness, you got to find your peace, you got to work through things. And then you probably don't even realize you're going through it until you look back and like, man, that was a really big struggle. At least that's really what it was for me. So um, I also, for me, you know, I thought I was in a great program at Florida, we went to a sugar bowl and I thought that was the way to have success. And I got to temple and I saw a whole different way that coach rule went, went about his business uh, which to me is now brilliant. But at the time I pushed against it, right? Just like anything in academia, in sports, in your job. Um, though it's a great question, Joe. We could talk for hours about it, but the mental health side of it is, is the number one thing. And it's becoming more of a forefront in sports, which is tremendous talk. People say not enough, but hey, let's look at the bright side. It's being talked about now more than ever. So yeah, I definitely struggle with things off the field. And on the field, I was still in a lot of pain. I literally remember crying in pain in practice because my feet were hurting that bad. So I, I wasn't all roses when I got to Temple when it came to my health either. But knock on wood, I've been healthy since about 2015. So things uh, have been, been okay. Great question, Joe. Thanks, man. Thank you for answering that. I appreciate it. You're going to have me thinking deep tonight, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Uh, Messina, we'll go to you next. Great. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you, Colin, for sharing your experiences. It's been very insightful and all your advice has been wonderful. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, with your transition to using podcasts as a platform, and as you said, you were you participated in all kind of the fields of creating it, editing it. Um, there, there always seems to be like that learning curve of like learning the programs, the equipment, the materials, what to do, how to use it. So I guess my question is, how did you stay motivated and not be discouraged from uh, the tries and errors of trying to figure out that world of media? That's a great question. Um, appreciate you asking it. I, they're all been awesome questions tonight, guys. I really appreciate it. It's got me thinking hard. Uh, how did I work through it? Because today I was building our best love podcast and it takes a lot. I got to download like 10 different episodes and kind of trim what I like and what I want out of it. And it crashed on me. I movie on t today on me twice. And I'm like, Oh my God, I just spent so much time on it. But because I spent some time having a backup situation in there at one point in time, because it crashed on me before Messina, uh, it, it came back alive and it came back to about 90% done. And now it's being uploaded. So uh, it's a great question because the technology world, as we all know, can be very, very, very frustrating, especially early on. Um, so it's just finding what you are comfortable with. And I built everything of mine on GarageBand, even though it's all audio based, because I feel like I have a good just kind of sense as to how things go. And I don't know if I could work on anything but a Mac, because that's all I know, even though there's awesome great computers out there. So I don't have an answer to that question, I guess, directly. It's just, I, this is what I want to do. And I know I can do it. And I know I can put out a good product. Um, and I'm lucky to have a following base, you know, that I've been working on and starting and building that brand for a long time. So I guess I've just the urge to provide too and give some content and have some fun along the way. So, uh, it's a great question and hope I answered it. Okay. Thank you. You did. Thank you. So we got Sean's up. I don't, maybe John. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't realize I was muted. Sean. Sorry about that. Sean. We'll go to you next. I love your flag jersey. I do not like your Arsenal flag going with that. Don't worry. That's my roommate. Owens. <laughs> I'm a Chelsea fan, but uh, oh. yeah, th thanks for taking the time to do this. And <clears throat> speaking of soccer, actually, I, I was on a set piece soccer show with Esteban Suarez last year. Uh, we, we covered Premier League. So really cool to see him still working with you. That's yeah, um, great. I love having Temple people uh, involved. And we're looking for people, by the way. This is a recruiting pitch. Okay. Anybody wants to help, help me run a TikTok? All right. 
reach out to the people to be in this. Uh, and and let, me, um, let me hold you here, Sean. If anybody wants my contact, go through John, go through Sarah, go through Karen, and they'll give you my direct sell. Um, that's how I operate. Um, and, and, and you can reach out to me at any time. I'll take my, it may take me a little bit to get back to you, uh, but I'll, we'll probably, let's just do this. Uh, let's do email and then we'll go from there. All right, let's just do email and go from there. Um, but I, I truly firmly believe that and then would love to connect. Reach out, anybody, any questions, any thoughts, anything. Sean, far away, brother. Yeah, so uh, what specifically is the best way you think to make a name for yourself and, and start garnering a following on Twitter so that people really remember you and want to keep consuming your content? So again, it's about the quality of content, right? We talked about that before. It's about what you want to engage in. It's about the alleys you want to be in. If you're at alscoop.com and your temple football, you, you want to be up to date with everything. You want to be tweeting things along that, that rhythm, that path. You can go off rogue and have fun. But at the end of the day, like, what are you commenting on? What are you talking about? Um, it's a great question because there's so many ways to go about it. How do I want to grow my brand? It all goes back to your brand. I think they all coexist together. What are you doing to help pump the brand? Like for me, I play in the NFL. It hasn't always been the case. It won't be the case. It could be gone tomorrow. That's how the NFL works. But I've built the brand up over all the places I've traveled from Birmingham, Alabama to Tampa, Florida, to Charlotte, North Carolina, to wherever, Chicago, to New York, to Temple, to Florida, um, all the places I've been in between, all the tryouts I've been in New Orleans and Detroit. So there's a definitely a calculated approach to how I go about things. And that's just everything counts and it's thought out and nothing sporadic. And for me, I always think about like, am I tweeting something that my head coach would have a problem with? And he's also a friend and Matt Rules, Temple, former Temple head coach. So uh, in a roundabout way, I'm answering your question, but it's, it's about the content. It's about what you're doing. Is it aligning with what you're talking about? Um, are you tweeting about, you know, Chelsea or Arsenal and you're having fun with that. And then you're talking about other things too in the sports world and you're staying involved and, and do you have something to support that to help your brand? Am I just um, Sean, the media member who works at the Philadelphia Inquirer, or am I Sean, the media member who works at the Philadelphia Inquirer and I'm working with, you know, branded sports and I'm also interning at the Sixers and I'm, and I'm building just kind of that here's the four or five things I do. Here's what I am. And here's my social media that supports it. Here's my LinkedIn that supports it. And, and I think that's a good holistic approach to go about those things. So for me, like example, it'd be like, all right, I play in the NFL. Um, I have a podcast. I've created a podcast in the past. Uh, we have a website at the podcast. Um, I worked in finance, I've worked in marketing, I've worked at this and that, and I have connections to Temple and all these different things. So again, what's supporting what you're doing? Because I don't think, like I said earlier, I would be getting a paycheck for the podcast if I was just an NFL, or I don't think I'd be getting a paycheck if I was just an NFL player randomly tweeting about a product. I think having the podcast alongside of it uh, allows me to make some money. So you got to find your quote unquote, you know, podcast to help grow your brand. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. No problem, man. Uh, James, we'll go to you next. Thanks for coming on, Colin. Appreciate it. Um, my question was, I heard you mention that you were, uh, you were a fan of Mike and Mike, uh, the podcast from a while ago. I know it's no longer a thing, but. Radio show from a while ago. Not everything was a podcast. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Radio. <laughs> yeah, not a podcast. Yeah, a radio I'm show. It was on TV. <laughs> but um, is there any other specific, like, color commentators of the world that you look up to or, like, rewatch like the games take any points just to like i don't know study how to co uh color oh the gus johnson's of the world joe bucks of the world yeah they're really true play-by-play -play. i always wondered if i could do play-by-play -play. i think my mind would be racing with add with the pure fact that i see what's happening out there and i can't articulate it i have to more paint yeah. the brush. so color for me is probably more up my alley um, mm -hmm. who have i listened to over the years I think the injection of Tony Romo was huge for the business. It allows players to now speak freely and really say what they want to say. Now, Tony's one of the best. It's hard to articulate it, and he sees the game unbelievably. Um, but he really opened up a lot for players to start describing things, um, which is tremendous. And he's getting paid a ton to do it, uh, almost a million a game. So, uh, you know, again, it's not about the money, but it shows the, the, the resources being put into people that have a good brand, that have, you know, a strong brand as a football player. And I'm a media member and now I'm doing color commentary. 
So I've listened to Tony Romo in the past. Um, really, truly, I think the best in the world at what they do is, is Colin Cowherd. Um, people will say in Philly or whatever he may be, but I think the way he develops takes, I think the way he talks through things, I think I don't agree with everything he says, make that completely clear everybody, but I think he's articulate. I think he tries his best to be fact-based. I think you're talking about his show, the herd, right? Correct. Yep. The yeah. herd. I think that's unbelievable. Um, so I have watched a lot of different things. I've also poured inspiration for how things have been described from a lot of different things. I love diners, drive-ins and dives. I love Food Network. I love fun, different shows. So I pull from a lot of different things and I find myself at times, you don't realize it, but all of a sudden you're like, wow, I just complete, I just said that. And I definitely did not get that from Tony Romo or Tr uh, Joe Buck or um, Greg Olson, who now is a former Carolina Panther tight end who does Fox. So it's a great question, James. I, I try to pull from a lot of different things and um, it's an ever growing process. And that's the wonderful thing about this business. Thank you so much. Thanks, Colin. We have three questions left. We'll go to Chris and Rose, and then we'll finish things off with the wonderful woman with, uh, for whom our sports media center is named, Claire Smith. We'll finish with Claire. But uh, Chris, we'll, we'll uh, go to you first uh, and then to Rose. Awesome. Uh, so, Colin, thank you uh, so much for staying back and uh, answering the rest of our questions since it is going over the time. Um, so the question that I had is just, oh. like, as a player, um, we were talking about social media a little bit uh, throughout this, but, like, um, as a player, how does social media impact you, like as an athlete, uh, not so much as like, um, like, well, through your media side, kind of like as a player, um, do you, are there times where you feel like you need to get off of it just because you see like a lot of negative stuff? Because I know sometimes the media can be toxic. And just curious if um, you have any experience with that. I, I, I as a player, thankfully, I will someday probably, the odds are, I have not faced the public criticism um, I've got the casual DM from a fan. Why'd you do that? Why'd you jump off sides with some choice words? Uh, why'd you do different things? But I'm not Greg Olson or Cam Newton. Again, I'm talking about Carolina Panthers, giving examples. I'm not these big stars that, you know, are making tons and they're very public. Um, so I haven't had the direct uh, impact. But yeah, social media has an impact on things. Like I said before, when we started talking, people say it's a distraction it's a part of life. Everything's a part of life. How you value it as an athlete is on you, how you value someone's opinion that you wouldn't ask an opinion on anything. You know, that's how you handle things. Yes. There's a lot of mental health situations when it comes to that things. And I think as an athlete, you got to know where you lie on different things. Um, I didn't play well against the Eagles. Here's an example, probably the worst game I've played, uh, which was devastating, right? Cause I'm from Philly and would love to play well against the Eagles, but just being honest, I didn't play well. And I was following all these Eagles accounts like I do because I'm from Philly and I worked in the Philadelphia market and I did Eagles pre and post game live. And I had to unfollow everybody <laughs> because I just couldn't see it. I just could not see it. Um, it was bothering me. It was irking me. And that was like the week after I would go back and follow it now. And I stay in touch with the Philly market and I have a ton of friends in the Philly media. Um, so, no, it's a great question. How does it affect different players? There's a bunch of different ways it affects guys, but you all learn how to deflect. And then I guess I'm kind of a part of it because I have the pod. I have so many different things. I have friends in the business. I'm constantly interacting on it too. So you can use it as a strength. I think you can, and you can make it a part of your brand development. Great question, Chris. Appreciate you, man. Uh, Rose, we'll go to you next. Uh, my question is a lot more informal compared to everyone else's, but um, obviously – with your job, you travel a lot. And I was wondering if you found the city with the best food yet. Oh, see, this is the type of questions we need, Rose. And this is exactly, no, every question has been great. This is exactly what I'm talking about, about holistically and connectability. This is what it's about. Like I have a foodstagram. I have to lost my password, so I have to get it back going again, but I should. <laughs> food, drinks, football. Like my wife has one, all our friends have one. We, we've all done it. Like what's your connectability? Like people want to connect. And if you're just the basic, um, you know, cookie cutter, whatever athlete, you just won't, or media person, right? I don't think you can, you can have that connectability. You got to show who really you are. But Rose, seriously, very, very important question. The best food city through my travels? 
Uh, it's great. It's a great question. I I'll say this. My wife's from Houston. Houston has some of the best food on earth from just good old Texas barbecue to Tex-Mex to Italian food to steaks. Uh, I mean, you name it, they got it. I would say Houston's up there. When I was with the Giants, that was incredible. All the restaurants in New York. Uh, fun story, we went to Mastro's, I think it was, and we were walking in. They're like, hey, we got a rookie dinner at Mastro's, and we're going to go. We got on the team bus, and we go through the city, and uh, we're walking through this restaurant, and we got a standing ovation. I was like, what is this? What is this? Mm -hmm. Like, people probably think I'm a coach, but – uh yeah that was a unique experience and we had like all we ate unbelievable like butter cake and all these different things that was crazy i weighed in like five pounds overweight the next day i almost got fined we do get fined if we're overweight and underweight <laughs> fun fact uh but there's some that's a great question rose i think there's great food in charlotte what's your favorite food city in your travels i haven't really been anywhere i'd probably just <laughs> stay here i like running terminal me and my roommates go like every friday yeah that's a great call i mean philadelphia Tremendous food. Some of the best, I think, that I've been, that I've had. Mm -hmm. Chicago, Philly, Houston, New York, big cities. I know that's probably cliche. I love the food in Birmingham. I was so excited to go to Birmingham. Uh, in the AF, there were some great places like San Diego and San Antonio and some cool places I wanted to check out. But Birmingham was like one I circled. And I ended up going there just by kind of luck and I got to try all the different food and the whole new experience. So I think the experience comes with food and then, you know, sports combined and media, that's like a thrive market now. So yeah, if you could be a foodie and be a media member and have sports, there's your brand. Fair question. Thank you. Thanks Rose. Thanks Colin. Claire Smith. Wow. In. Hey, Colin. Welcome. Uh, thank you for doing this. The students are I'm just getting a life lesson from their questions and it's wonderful. Beautiful. Also, I can't wait to meet you and thank you for coming aboard on the steering committee. Um, it's gonna be fun working with you, but uh, I have a question as a, as a old, uh, old fashioned journalist. Um, do you consider yourself a journalist who happens to play football or a football player who happens to be a podcaster and the, the reason I ask that is that I was just trying to put myself in your place this week in particular when the news in the NFL has been somewhat controversial so I don't know if you go there in terms of um, the Green Bay Packers and vaccination and all that or do you um, stay away from that uh, because it's um, it's not in your uh, in the avenue you wish to travel? How do you just make that determination? I am, and Claire, thank you for uh, for having me a part of what what we have going on in Temple, and I'm honored to be a part of it. I'm really excited for the future with it, and. Uh, yeah, it's a great, it's an unbelievable question, of course, coming from the great, the great Claire Smith. And <laughs> I'm a football player that is a podcaster and then a media member, I guess, second. Uh, and I have to uh, get that across to some of my coaches sometimes who give me some grief for doing this thing because they don't really have any knowledge of what I'm doing or what okay. we're doing or what's going on. They just, everything's a distraction that we talked about earlier instead of this is my escape. What I, and again, I'm going off topic. Am I going to watch? three hours of Netflix, or am I going to, I don't know, talk to my team at not for long and uh, get involved with some different media things and talk to John about, you know, what's going on at Temple football and reach out to all these different people and send emails and be involved. So I enjoy being involved in a lot of different things. And that's kind of my free time away from football, the hot button stuff. I really try to stay away from. Okay. And not that my opinions wouldn't align with I guess mainstream media and thoughts. It's just, it's such a shame that we're in a world where I probably don't feel comfortable commenting. I think that's the biggest shame in my opinion. Like I wouldn't be able to say the right thing, whether I said how I feel or not. I, and I think that's something that, that's, it's just how the world is. And 
for young media members like yourselves, I, I try to stay away, even on the podcast, we'll stay away from sports topics that my co-host will bring stuff up. We can't even talk about some of the top things in sports because all of a sudden now I'm a distraction. And that's the last thing I want, Claire, uh, as you okay. know. And you've covered plenty of players that have been distractions <laughs> for teams over the years. So, uh, yeah, I don't touch those things. I don't touch those things. Do you, do you foresee that changing um, post-football career and if media is, is your next career? That's a great question. I do. I, I do think I would gonna, I'm going to be involved in media. really do. I love to coach and I love football. And I think I have a wealth of, of knowledge of the game and passion to learn more. Um, but I think the lifestyle of football and the coaching side of it, I think it needs to be edited. They don't know their families. They don't know their kids. Uh, the way that someone who may work a, even someone who may work a 7 a.m. to a 7 p.m. job would know their kids. Um, and that, that's a turn off to me. I think the media side allows you a little bit more freedom. still allows you to be close to the game and to touch on maybe like a hot button question. I think I'd be more involved in that things when, when those things when I'm done. And I also think it would give me some more time to educate myself on those things. I don't feel comfortable, Claire, and the group commenting on things like politics, because to be honest with you, I'm not someone who's really into politics. And that's not like I'm turned off by it or into it. I just... I don't have a, like, you can only handle so much capacity wise. Yeah. And I just, I just don't have a, a passion for it. I don't have a passion for some of the hot button questions, but yeah, I think with the way of the world now with how things are going, I try to steer clear. And when I'm done, I think I'll definitely sound off a little bit more, maybe be myself a little bit more, say a, more of a, a, a curse word or two, uh, yeah. you know, because that's maybe who, who, who I am instead of, uh, you know, blanketing things away but that's yeah, a great question thank you so much for the questions claire uh thank you for for doing all of this the, uh, it's lovely to see the interaction with the students and and they obviously have a great role model in you so can't wait to meet you oh thank you so much that's a that's so nice of you, of you to say and uh no i look forward to doing this more i talked to the crew here before I, there's no reason if, if they like to have me back that we can do this more often we'll finish with uh Carter's got one more. He's got his hand up. All right. I just want to fire one. Um, Cause you saying that like sparked this in my head. So how does, um, especially around a time like this, could you give us a little bit of insight on like how people deal with the media in, in an NFL locker room, especially like, you know, we just talked about the Packers situation or just all these like big media situations that we all see, but then like, you guys are the athletes that are like kind of dealing with all this, all these issues. Like, is it talked about much or is it kind of pushed under the rug and let's just handle business? Well, the answer to the first part of the question, how do we handle it? I think it's easier now to handle the media than ever, even though there's more topics like this. We talked to the media on zoom. When I walked in Chicago, again, I was with the giants in preseason. There wasn't any media members in the, in the locker room. This was 2017. When I walked into the locker room in Chicago, I'm walking out of the shower in the locker room. It's a men's locker room and half the locker room is full of male and female reporters. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, I, again, I had no idea. I was a rookie in the NFL. I've never, ever experienced anything like that in my life. And I'm like, this is, this is unique. <laughs> like, <laughs> like going to the bathroom and get changed now again, just being transparent with you guys. I'm like, this is really interesting. And then like guys have to answer questions in their towel. Or like in their shorts, like, and they would have no choice. You'd be like, oh, like your media member would, you know, your li the liaison between the media and the players would be like, hey, you're free? Well, no, I'm not free right now. I need to take some time to think about things. You weren't really given that grace period now. And again, the, you know, the, 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 communi the, the communications, the media people in the building are helping you and they're prepping you for the questions to be asked, of course, but that's their job. But now you got, you can take as much time as you want everyone's hanging on a zoom meeting like this is waiting to ask or ask a question. So um, that's how we handle it is there's, some, there's some more time uh, and everyone's more awake of what's going on and the questions. Uh, and I think that goes on guys are more and more involved in what's, what's happening. And, and now you can't really miss anything. 
right? That's all going on. So do we talk about these things? Absolutely. Have we talked about the vaccination in the building? Absolutely. Have we talked about, you know, racism issues in our country? Absolutely. And that's like, for me, the best and the biggest takeaway is I get to talk to men and women in a building, but priorly men in a locker room that were not brought up 99% like I was didn't have the things that I had. And I'm so fortunate I had them, but also to be able to hear perspectives from people from all different skin color and different perspectives. And then take that into life. Talk about educating yourself. I've been on to ask some of my best friends who are black men, tough questions that a white person could probably never ask, ask someone who's black. And that's an unbelievable gift that the sports world gives. And I'm all, probably off topic there. But you ask, like, do we talk about these things? Absolutely. I'm trying to be transparent as possible with you guys. And, and that helps you as a media member, how you can articulate your questions, how you can talk through things, how you can bridge those gaps, how you can put a player in a comfortable situation that maybe is an uncomfortable topic. Uh, because there's a lot of them, especially now more than ever. Because, And as a player, you don't want to say the wrong thing because you know people look up to you. You know people are watching you. You know you're going to get skewered on social media if you say the wrong thing. So that's also the problem. Media members are going to get less from players now more than ever because the players say the wrong thing, right? And just are being themselves. Um, you know, they could lose sponsorships. They could lose, and some of it, right, rightfully so. They deserve to lose those things. But some of it, right, that's the way of the world. So um, I appreciate the question, Carter. I, I hope everyone uh, got something out of this. And again, there's my email below. And I hope the transparency was was ideal for everyone. I, I really appreciate you guys. Thanks, Colin. This was incredible. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you to all of you for sticking around and and for all your questions. Hopefully, we'll do more of these in the, in the future and stay tuned for more of them. And uh, again, a big thank you to Colin for his time and just for going uh, twenty five minutes past past seven. I know you're busy, buddy. I really, really, really appreciate this. No problem. If 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 there's more interest in doing these things. And it's something that I need to orchestrate just to get the Temple community involved. And we can just do these all on the not for long media Zoom. And I'll just, whoever emails me and you guys want to just do these workshops once a week, once every two weeks. This is what it's all about, in my opinion, and uh, connecting and connectability and all these different things. So reach out, guys. I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing from you all. And, and uh, thank you so much for your time. Claire, thanks for joining us.